We've all heard of the 8800 series from Nvidia, a legendary set of graphics cards that changed the entire market. But who really remembers the flagships that would follow it? This right here is Nvidia's forgotten flagship, the final GTX Plus card, namely the GeForce 9800 GTX Plus which was a card that managed to do alright for what was one of the first ever cards utilizing the 55 nanometer process and it was quite a little powerhouse with 128 CUDA cores, 512 megabytes of GDDR3 based VRAM and utilized the very successful Tesla architecture, given it was very similar to previous generations like the high end 8800 GTX card but we'll be touching more on the history a bit later. Given its flagship status, it needed two 6 pin power connectors and could reach up to 140 watts of power consumption, which isn't really that high, but back in the day for the card this was meant to be, it was a surprisingly big deal. Featuring support for DX10 on release, it can still breathe through a lot of applications thanks to some relatively modern API support, relatively modern meaning newer than DX9, and fortunately the final drivers on this card are absolutely fantastic, so that's nothing to worry about either, regardless of the operating system you actually want to use. But if that all sounds so great, why are we never talking about this card? Originally released in summer of 2008, it helps to paint a picture of the scene of what was going on in the market at the time. See, Nvidia in the previous years were dominating the market. If you wanted any DirectX 10 based card, you didn't want what AMD was offering. We've already looked at it before and it wasn't that great. The 8800 based cards, however, well, even in their lowest form possible, were running things like Crisis in HD resolutions and they were running it well. It didn't matter if you were a budget buyer or wanted the high end 8800 series, it was spread out so much with variants like GT, GTS or GTX, whatever tier you really wanted to buy turned out to be pretty decent. As long as it wasn't anything below the 8800 series like the 8600 cards which really aren't all too great. Anyway, a lot of the high end was refreshed on to be the 9000 series. The same cards with a new name. Anyway, essentially it was a new name with a lower price tag. Exactly the same as what we see today. But this card isn't really one of those. No, our little GTX Plus card comes into play later on. Nearing the end of the 9000 series lifespan, it was time to release a new set of DirectX 10 based cards with some new DX10 flagships that were actually, you know, more powerful than the last ones. And this was Nvidia's GTX 200 series. And performance was good. Genuinely, it seemed to do really well, everything you'd expect from a new generation. The issue is that AMD, well, they're a company and they aren't idiots. And they just so happened to release one of their most revolutionary sets of graphics cards for years with the HD 4000 series, which absolutely decimated every Nvidia release they had out there, at least when it came to value, which is what matters to a lot of consumers. So how could Nvidia compete? It seemed like AMD had actually struck some gold for the first time in a few years, and that's where things get a little bit interesting. See, AMD's cards were cheaper to make. Nvidia was still using the 65 nanometer process to make the GTX 200 series. So AMD could make cheaper cards because they were using a process that was 10 nanometers smaller and that makes a bit of a difference when you're producing these cards in bulk and you're trying to compete because you've got a larger profit margin. You can make these cards cheaper. And for those of you with keen ears, you'll already know where this story's going. See, this card was not only the quirky GTX Plus card, it was also a cost saving measure because it was the first Nvidia card on the smaller 55 nanometer node. 10 nanometers smaller than their current generation. It was based on an older architecture on a cheaper node. It had a purpose. It needed to be a bit of a budget option. And with the reputation that the Tesla architecture already had with its original iterations, its performance could have been less than desirable and it'd be carried by name alone. It also had the mind share. But was it ever really enough? Well, reviewers were confused by the name. I mean, it is a confusing name. They thought it was a rebrand of a rebrand. But when news got out it was on a 10 nanometer smaller node, there was a little bit of excitement, which promptly ended up floundering. The card performed very much on average 2 FPS better than the older GeForce 9800 it was based on. And if you think the names are confusing at this point, you'd be right. 
as ultimately the 8800, 9800, 9800 GTX Plus all performed within a margin of each other, all had similar names and could all be found on sale alongside each other. How confusing is that? You've got three cards in front of you, all with similar names, two of them are the exact same bloody card and one of them is the same card on a smaller process. They all perform about the same. <laughs> But how did this all end up? How did this end up being the forgotten flagship? Well, the card could overclock, a lot of reviewers praised it for that, and you could genuinely push these things to pretty high clocks and it was fun to do so. The issue is, most people couldn't care for it, because the cheaper models didn't have the cooling to overclock, and if you spent £40 or $50 less, you could have bought a comparative Radian card that outright performed better than an overclocked one straight out of the box. So it floundered around on the market for a little while and arguably it has aged better than the comparing Radeon cards and the performance is still pretty awesome today 12 years later. But at the time, re-releasing an already re-released flagship as a budget card? Well it simply didn't work. 12 years later though these things are pretty damn cheap because most people don't really care for them. Anyone looking to buy a high end retro card is looking at either the GTX 280 and onwards or the old school 8800 GT or GTX cards. I genuinely found this card at the bottom of a box of graphics cards and I must have bought it years ago and just forgotten about it because it's simply not that interesting. But how well does it perform? Starting off with one of the most surprising titles with GTA 5, which genuinely ran perfectly in 720p HD with the normal settings used, as let's be honest, we do only have half a gig of VRAM and when you launch the game it'll be sure to tell you that's not enough, but seriously it will work fine. The only time I could get any real frame drops was when there were a lot of particle effects going on, and even then the game didn't really drop to anything much lower than the 40ish FPS mark. And of course, rain and effects didn't cause us too much trouble either. Neither did driving, which is one area where the game's engine can be quite stressful on an older graphics card. Definitely a great experience and much better than a lot of cards I have used. Fable The Lost Chapters was an older game but one that still looks very nice and needed to be tested because I'm actually getting rid of this card after this video and it's going to be playing this game a lot. So I'd imagine that running the game with the highest settings possible in a 1050p resolution, seeing that it never dropped below 100fps once, shows that it genuinely runs the game really well. It didn't have any issues with anything, there were no bugs at all, no graphical effects, which can happen with newer Nvidia cards apparently. CSGO was just about playable in 720p with the lowest settings used, but the frame times were still far from stable in heavy scenes and gunfights. It was still fully playable, however smokes and the usual intense action you can see in casual game modes could really tank the frame rate. Towards the end of the round it would stabilise the frame rate slightly with slightly less bad drops, but really by that point you're not really going to be alive because everything just sort of felt slow and floaty when I was trying to play. Just one of those reasons why the game is definitely playable, but it's not really a competitive experience and dropping the settings much lower just doesn't give you a good time personally. But still, not a bad showing for what is essentially a 12 year old graphics card. BeamNG does run using the DirectX 10 fork of the game. However, anything other than low settings proved to be far too much for the car to run, and some of the higher detailed cars were genuinely hard to use as the car just couldn't keep up with the amount that it needed to be rendered for them. But for most of the smaller and simpler maps, with the stock vehicles in game it handled them more than fine with a fully playable average above 30fps. I will say going with even lower settings didn't really net us much of an improvement in terms of frame rate, so I believe a lot of our issues here are more driver related than they are card related, but still very much playable. Even relatively new strategy games will run alright with some of the settings turned up. We had Civilization V running with medium settings in a 1050p resolution, and other than the progressing turns taking a little bit of a tank more than they usually do, which are probably one of the most intensive parts of the game, it ran really really well. I also loaded up a late game save which I'm not going to show here because I was a multiplayer game and I haven't really asked everyone's permission, and even then it still ran really really well. So these types of titles are going to run perfectly on an older card like this. This one here proved to be really surprising for myself, but Skyrim ran with a near locked 60fps with medium settings in a very nice resolution, and you really can't ask for much better than that can you? 
For a forgotten flagship it really does handle these games well, and I've used the comparing AMD cards and although they can manage higher settings, they don't have as stable experience as this. I did have a few more frame drops on the HD4850, which is what this card was directly competing against. Maybe it's time to do a test at some point with both cards going up against each other, but really that's a topic for another video. When you look at the frame times here though, and the driver side optimizations this game must have, it was a very good experience. Banished is another example of the type of indie game that can target this hardware really well. Even with higher settings the game looked and ran fantastic, something I've been saying a lot this video, and you really can't ask for much more than that in a modern title. So for modern city builders, as long as you stick to the simpler indie ones, they do run alright. You just won't be playing city skylines or anything like that. Minecraft did run pretty well. However, I was using the settings that the game launched with, which are the ones we used on that GTX 550 Ti card I bought, which may have actually been a little bit unfair on the card. But even so, with fancy settings and a 16 chunk render distance loaded, we had a great experience. However, I would add that lowering that render distance might be the best thing to do, as we were eating through quite a lot of VRAM with a large texture pack and those settings. Still, all in all, ran really decent. But can it run Crisis? Well, fortunately, the card was based on one of the first cards that was actually able to run Crisis in nice settings. So, with medium settings and a 720p HD resolution, we saw a fully playable 64 FPS average, which the game tends to stick to more or less a lot of the time. So, those big AAA titles from around the release of the card, they will run perfect on this forgotten flagship. Just not as well as the card it was up against, which was the HD4850, which I know can manage this with higher settings. As for 3D Mark, well, I did manage to run a few tests to find out how well the card compares against a load of other cards that I'd benchmarked and tested, while also running a test for temperature and stability, because this thing needs to be stable to be used, as this is one of the weaker cooling setups as well, which is why I'm not really overclocking the card. Despite this though, the card flew through all of the 3D Mark tests with decent scores, and thanks to the lower process it's using, the card didn't actually get all too hot either. In fact, you can understand why people like to overclock them, as we did actually have some headroom on the cheaper models, but today I'm not really going to be doing that. I did try briefly, and I managed to get 3 FPS extra in Crisis. It's just not worth it to claw back a couple of frames per second, and I think the card has done more than enough at stock settings. So, in conclusion once again, there we have it, the very much looked over and forgotten 9800 GTX Plus. And although it wasn't a great buy back in the day compared to the competition from AMD, but really this card has aged much more elegantly. And I've said it before and I'll say it again, AMD's TerraScale cars just didn't age well, the final drivers are nowhere near as reliable or stable as the ones for the card, and I wish AMD provided some older drivers more easily on their website, just in case you did want to buy one for retro uses. But talking about retro uses, given the card doesn't carry the 8800 series name, it seems a lot of people haven't really grasped onto the value aspect these have as older retro cards. I mean, this card even supports output directly to component, S-video, or composite, whatever you want to do, with the help of a little breakaway box. Ultimately, the GTX Plus series really did die off with this card, as the GTX Plus never really caught on. Really, the Plus seems to have stood for older card on a newer generation, which is exactly what we're seeing today with the RX 590. That is very literally a two-generation older card, the RX 480, on a 12 nanometer process. You know, it doesn't perform much better unless you're overclocking, very similarly to this. Maybe I'll revisit that in 10 years or something like that. Really though, it's not as good as the HD4850 is for retro games, as that will ultimately be able to get higher settings. But when it comes to the price tag, these two are very similar nowadays. And if you want to run some relatively new titles like GTA 5 and newer indie titles at the same time, I really do believe that the 9800 GTX Plus has the edge over AMD. It has just aged much nicer. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed finding up and me summing up what could essentially be described as an improved and impressive rebrand of a rebrand that time really just forgot. Thank you very much for watching this video, and good night. Mm -hmm.
Just a little video I thought I'd make before I send this card off, because it does have an interesting story, which is probably why I bought it and promptly forgot about it. Still, I don't think I paid too much for it, probably a fiver from CEX, they are very cheap cards to get a hold of, and I have a huge video going out next week, so do stick around for that.